anybody who is towards the top of their field, there's a moment where you think, okay, it's worked a thousand times before, so the thousand and one time is going to work. And you can lose track or lose sight of the need to always be bringing curiosity to the situation. Because the moment you think, hey, do you know what, AJ, I've got this. Right. I mean, yes, you need to have self-confidence and authority and credibility. So it's that fine line between you need to listen to me without me saying you need to listen to me. And also, I'm not the chairman of the Good Ideas Club. Well, welcome to the show, Scott. Great to have you. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. And I think for audience members who might not be familiar with your work, I'd love to hear a bit of the backstory. And did you always know you wanted to be a police negotiator? I, I often say that, you know, you know, when you're at school and uh, you get into like your mid-teens and there's talk about what you're going to do for a career and you sit down and the careers advisor says, so Scott, let's have a look at your, your, your test scores here and what you're good at, what you're not. You know, how about, you know, a train driver or a teacher okay. or something, or a lawyer, but at no point did they say, hey, do you fancy negotiating with kidnappers for a living? Uh, but I don't think it's one of those jobs you, you set out to do. You kind of fall into it. And every, everybody who did it, particularly in the private sector, this was their second or third career. Okay. And um, we got told on, well, the first day when I... Um, when, when I joined the company, and I don't know if this is true or not, but more people have been to the International Space Station than do this job full-time, tier one uh, response consultants, you know, the wow. kidnap negotiators. Whether or not it's true, I don't know, but it sounded good. It boosted the ego <laughs> and uh, a, a sense of belonging there. But, um, yeah, I, I kind of did a few things when I left school, and then I, I joined the police, I joined Scotland Yard, and I did... 16 years there, I lived every single day, okay. literally every single day um, as a detective. And the last five years of that, I've got an opportunity to work on and help resolve kidnap for ransom negotiations. Particularly my job then was to get the phone call at two o'clock in the morning. And it was never 11 a.m. on a Wednesday morning when there's nothing else going on. It was always kids' parties, anniversaries, or three o'clock on a Saturday or Sunday morning. Um, get in a car, blue light, fast run to wherever it was in London where the family usually were receiving a phone call from the kidnappers due to the fact that son, brother usually had been taken, uh, been kidnapped, uh, and a ransom was being uh, demanded. And um, my job was to get alongside the family and ultimately bring a bit of order out of chaos, hence the title yeah. of, of my book, really. And that was my job. It was to bring uh, the calmness, grounded centeredness, come up with some form of strategy along with uh, a colleague who would always be there as well. And then would work that case, sit with the family or with the company until the hostage came back. And then after about five years of doing that in the police, I, I kind of woke up some might call it a midlife crisis. I don't know. Okay. And, you know, early 40s thinking, you know what, I, I want to go and get a second career and actually I want to do this full time. Um, and I want to join a company in London. There's only two or three companies in the world that specialize in this. As you can imagine, it's quite a niche yeah. subject. Uh, and then I spent another seven or so years, 10 years um, doing that all over the world, helping to get people back resolve cyber extortion cases, piracy, all those similar peril types. So while you're working with the police, I mean, how frequent is this happening? In London at the time is about one a week. Okay. And, and let's put that into context. Worldwide, the actual figures of kidnapping, let's just take kidnap. I mean, the, you've got hostage taking, crisis negotiation and kidnapping. They're all... Similar but different. The okay. the classic bank robbery gone wrong where the, the bank robbers are taking hostages and they want a, a million a million dollars and a plane, fuel fuel plane out of there. They're like rocking horse, whatever. You know, they're they're very few and far between. The next likely is the 
uh, domestic type situation or, or there's somebody who's going through some kind of crisis in their personal life usually and they're on top of a building on a jump off okay. or they're going to take their own life. Um, and then the third element, which is where I really specialised in, where somebody has been taken specifically in order to get usually money by way of a, a ransom payment. And so we had about one a week. And this was just in London. And it was usually what we call bad on bad. Okay. So bad dudes are kidnapping other bad dudes because there's a, a lack of respect, money owed, a drug mm. debt gone wrong. Or usually they would kidnap a family member of the other bad dude to kind of exert some leverage and, okay. and pressure on that. Uh, but worldwide, there's probably 30 to 45,000 5, kidnappings a year estimated. But most countries where it takes place, obviously they want tourism and business development. So they're not going to necessarily right. advertise. advertise, hey, we're the kidnap capital of the world. Come and invest your millions of dollars here. Not so, a title you want. No. So I think it's pretty unique when we think about negotiations because most of us think about negotiation with one other party. But you're in a situation where you're also negotiating with the family around what to do, how to handle it, their emotions, because their response and their reaction is just as important as the kidnappers. Probably more so. And what I mean by that is I reckon 80% of my time on a case would be spent managing what we call the crisis within the crisis. Okay. And that's no different in, at work. You know, dealing with the client the customer, the kidnappers, is relatively straightforward. It's a business transaction. And don't forget, kidnappers are just businessmen who want to get a good deal. Yeah. And the professional gangs out there, they will look after the hostages. Okay. But my time, effort, energy, focus was spent trying to manage, placate, competing egos, internal politics, competing demands, um, a sense of maybe a bit of significance. Some family member thought, that this is my moment to shine. Mm. Ego-driven bosses who didn't like being advised what to do. And as you can imagine, this is the most highly emotive set of circumstances most people will find themselves in, in their lives. Yeah. And again, when I used to rock up to the family kitchen or the company boardroom, you could almost sense the, 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 the palpable relief, me walking in the room, everybody thinking, oh, the cover is here. And so, but then I had to kind of follow up with the good, so to speak. I had to be able, be able to uh, repay that trust by, you know, offering the right kind of advice and coming up with a negotiation strategy to get their loved one back. So was there a moment that you recall where you felt okay, I'm, I'm really getting the hang of this and I feel like I'm becoming expert level at managing this kidnap negotiation process. It's a very fine line. That's a great question. I think anybody who is towards the top of their field, sports, media, corporate life, negotiation, whatever, sales, there's a moment where you think, okay, I am consciously competent here and I'm, I'm almost unconsciously competent. It's, it's, it's instinctive now. There's a danger where that confirmation bias, right? All these biases come in. Um, hey, it's worked a thousand times before, so the thousand and one time is going to work, and you can lose track or lose sight of the need to always be bringing curiosity. In fact, more curiosity than assumption to the situation. And I always used to approach, even towards the last days of me doing it, with a beginner's mind. You know, that Zen approach of, if this is the first time I was approaching it, what would I be thinking? What were the questions I'd be asking? Even the really basic questions, because the moment you think, hey, do you know what, AJ, I've got this. Just, you listen to me. You listen to good old Scott. Right. I mean, yes, you need to have self-confidence and authority and credibility. And if I, if I didn't establish that within the first 30 seconds of meeting the client, they wouldn't, they wouldn't take heed of my advice. So it's that fine line between you need to listen to me without me saying you need to listen to me and also with me always having at the back of the mind of 
I'm not the chairman of the Good Ideas Club. You know, it's going, making sure that everybody within that crisis management team we would establish, family members, colleagues, whomever, what am I not seeing here? What are we missing? What's another opportunity? What's another way we could look at this? How else could we work through this, this, this challenge? Because out of 300 cases I dealt with, there wasn't a single one that went according to plan. Mm. There's always little nuances, little uh, bumps in the road, um, because you're dealing with human beings. Right. And we are, despite what a lot of people like to believe and think, we're not rational creatures. No. Emotions. We, we emotions drive everything. And the, there's a great line from Dr. Jill Bolt Taylor. And her TED talk is worth checking out about her stroke of insight, it's called. And she says, you know, we're feeling creatures that think, not thinking creatures that feel. And in a negotiation perspective, unless we can identify, manage, mitigate, the emotions, we're going to miss a trick. We're going to miss something. We're not going to get the best deal. Um, and there's lots of negotiation theory out there and you go to some law school or whatever and they teach you about BATNA and all these other concepts and so they, they work occasionally. There's, there's some merit to them. But the, 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 the idea of you can separate the person from the problem, that's just BS really. You, you can't, not, not long term. Yeah, if you just want to buy a car or want to buy a, a candy bar, yeah, it, it's a transaction right. that doesn't need much emotion. But if you ultimately want to achieve the holy grail of negotiation and communication, which is a very sim similar thing, really, is you want to be able to uh, approach it of achieving cooperation and collaboration. And get that client for life, that customer for life, that colleague for life, you know, that build that trust. Right. So there's a lot to unpack there. I want to first talk about something you said, that first 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So, and especially in a situation where you're dealing with bad on bad. So what was that preparation for you on that first 30 seconds? And, and were there any specific things that you would do to establish trust in those moments? First of all, you've got to get your own mindset your own state, emotional state in order. Because if, if I go in there and I'm really super nervous, I'm unclear about what it is I'm going to do, uh, there's an incongruency between how I'm communicating about what I'm saying and how I'm saying it, uh, again, it's not going to end well. So I'd always spend time uh, preparing and getting my own head in the right space. And actually doing a bit of preparation, that could just be... So, you know, some breathing, some breathing exercises, just 30 seconds before walking in the room. And in fact, I would do this before every time we would sit down and jump on the phone call with kidnappers, I would just do a bit of box breathing, you know, in for four, hold for four, out for four, pause for four, and then repeat, you know. And, um, and once you balance that nervous system out, you can then walk into the room and you, you start off in, in the best place possible. And then when you've got to, to sit down with a family or the particularly on the bad on bad is you've got to be able to suspend your judgment and your mm. ego about these are just some low life criminals who are brought in upon themselves. And I've been asked, asked this before, actually, around, come on, Scott, surely you didn't put as much effort into some criminal as you would do with some, let's call it innocent business traveler who's been taken. I'm like, well... Yes, I did, actually, because it's not for me to pass judgment as to, hey, this person needs saving and this other person right. doesn't. Well, th there's also downstream effects of this. So if this goes awry, there are potentials for innocent people to be involved in whatever reaction there is to that kidnapper, uh, the person who's representing the person kidnapped, losing face or not being treated respectfully. Yeah, and and that's a really good point, as in... No matter what kind of negotiation you're dealing with, you've got to understand what are the underlying needs, wants, drivers. It's very rarely about the surface level request. You know, kidnappers would come on and go, I want a million dollars for AJ. Mm, okay, well, I know you're not going to get a million dollars for AJ because the family or the company can't pay that or won't pay it. 
But ultimately, I know really that you as the kidnappers, you want to be able to save face, to appear in control, to be able to walk away feeling as if you've actually got something from this deal. But that's the same in a business right. or in your personal life. If it's, do you know what, I'm right, you're wrong, and I'm going to prove that, and I'm going to dig my heels in, and heaven knows the world is getting more and more polarized with that kind of approach. And so if I can sit there thinking, okay, how can I help you walk away with what you feel is a good deal without me acquiescing, condoning, giving in, and me feeling I've got to give over more than what I'm happy to, then, you know, that that's where we want to end up, where both sides can walk away feeling they've got something that is... So in that situation, them. what is a, a good outcome? Like, what are you shooting for outcome-wise? Obviously, the person coming back safely who's been kidnapped, but... Okay, well, the thing is, we, what we don't want to do is say there's a million, say you say you get taken and there's a million dollar demand. I don't know if that's cheap or not for, for okay. you, but let's, uh, let's yeah, say there's inflation, a million. Inflation, inflation, okay, there's a million dollar demand. And your family go, okay, we've managed to, we've got a bit of savings, we've managed to clear out the account, we've sold our car really quickly and whatever. And yeah, we could probably get $900,000 million within a few days. If, if we pay the kidnappers that, what kind of message do you think that is going to send? Oh, they got to kidnap again. That's a great payday. Hey, this is a cash cow. We need a milk uh, forevermore. Yeah. It's too easy, too quick to pay. And again, there's no different in, in, in any other kind of negotiation. If you feel like you've left money on the table or there is still money left on the table, you're going to hold out for more. Right. And so what we want to do is we call it squeezing the orange. We want to make it appear that there is no more money left. And the way we do that, again, this is applicable to everyday life. Communicating, communication in general is do not be afraid of conflict. Embrace, embrace risk, embrace conflict in, in a conversation, in communication, negotiation. And remember, a negotiation is simply a conversation with a purpose. All right. And people will shy away from having those difficult conversations. And we all know, you know, that phone call, you know, you need to Should make making, yeah. and you keep putting it off or you're in that relationship and you know, you need to have that conversation, but you find a reason why you shouldn't. shouldn't. Yeah. Um, and so what we do with the kidnappers is very early on is, okay, there's a million dollar demand for you, but we're only got. 100,000. Mm. Do you think the kidnappers are going to go, hey, that's fine. I'll okay. take it. Yeah, we, 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 we overreached there. We get that. Yeah, pay the 100,000. We'll take. No, they're going to they're gonna bitch and moan and whine and make threats and, you know, mock executions and they'll go silent for days, weeks on, on end. But I want that conflict. I want that management of expectations early on. It's the same in business. Mm -hmm. If you know full well that you're never going to agree to what the other side is demanding, you've got to have that conversation early, get it out of the way, so then you can get into the real, meet the real, the proper negotiation, which it. is right. What we're going to do, you ask for a million, but we'll give you, I don't know, I can say 50, 60,000. They're not going to be happy bunnies. No. But straight away, I've set the expectations of where this is going to go. And people go, well, actually, let's just pay more money quickly and we can get the people back. But counterintuitively, if we can hold out, if we can embrace that initial conflict, and that doesn't mean we have to be rude or unpleasant or unprofessional. You can still have a smile and speak calmly and kindly to people and still say no. no. And we get to a point where we now enter a rhythm of a negotiation where, you know, we'll, we'll, they'll come down, we'll come up slightly, and then eventually we'll meet at a point where we knew we were going to meet up anyway. And it's almost like if you've got a graph and, you know, on the one axis it's coming down, the demand's coming down, and then our, um, our increase offers is coming up and then it will peter out and there'll be a really tiny gap between the demands and the offers for quite a while. But the danger there, especially if a few weeks have gone by now, 
and obviously the families are very emotional. They want their loved ones yeah. back. They go, the, there's only 20,000 in it. The kidnappers are saying, if you pay another 20,000 more, you can have them back. But if we suddenly, we've been holding out increases of five or seven, and then all of a sudden we'll go, oh, okay, yeah, here's another 20,000. Yeah. They're going to go. Well, there's more to be made. Oh, actually, and then you, you have to reset and you go, go back to the beginning again. So it's holding your nerve in those conversations. Know what your outcome is and hold your nerve and, um, yeah, expect to bump your ride as well. So, and obviously from the police perspective, kidnapping, it, it's illegal. So what are the consequences for the actual kidnappers outside of the negotiation that you're brokering? In the police and in, you know, law enforcement in, in Western countries, the bad guys are going to get nicked. They're, go they're going to get arrested and a case is going to get put against them. They're going to go to court, go to trial. More often than not. Although there was one case where we rescued the hostage and I was working with a brother who was communicating with the kidnappers because yeah. of the language. And so we, we get in release, we sit down, a bit of a debrief, and then we try and get some statements you know, down so we can use as evidence. And the, and, the, and the brother just turned around and went, officer, we'll take it from here. And you just kind of, you try to persuade them to kind of support the prosecution, but you just know full well, they're just, yeah. just going to take their own retribution. Their and justice is different. For, and who, who am I to judge them for that? But anyway, but then uh, in the private sector, my sole aim, my, my single focus is the safe and timely release of the hostages for an appropriate amount of money in order to mitigate against any future kidnappings. I am not interested then as to necessarily who the kidnappers even are or trying to arrest them or ambush them or rip right. them off. Uh, and actually, in some parts of the world, it's the police or the military that are involved in the kidnappings or certainly turning a blind eye to it. So it's a bit of an eye opener, depending on where you're in the world and which country you're operating in, depends on, let's call it the rules of engagement there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one thing that jumped out at us that, that we definitely agree on is, is everything in life is a negotiation. So mm -hmm. I know a lot of our audience members are like, okay, this is great, but I'm not going to be negotiating a hostage release, hopefully, fingers crossed, that no one has to encounter that. But everything is a negotiation, mm. whether it's your salary, buying a car, a house, but even in the day-to-day -day of just getting through life, you are negotiating whether you believe so or not. So let's unpack how to bring that mindset mm. piece to mastering negotiations to be more effective. I always say to people, Time spent in preparation is seldom wasted. And that doesn't mean you've got to prepare for every single conversation you have. Right. But you certainly do for the meaningful ones, the ones that require the most uh, involvement, have the biggest impact. Stakes, yeah. And, and as you said there, getting your mindset in the right place and it's approaching it with, I need to first understand what makes you tick before I start coming in with what I want. So I can't, I can't influence you unless I know what already influences you. And that's quite a humbling thing if you think about it. Because I need to spend the time, effort and energy being genuine, genuinely, because people can sniff out when you've been a bit Machiavellian and, them, yeah. Yeah, and BSing them. And so I need to be genuinely curious and intrigued about who you are. And I'm going to ask some really uh, powerful questions. Um, and the more open type questions I can ask, it doesn't need to sound like an interrogation, but I just need to get to a point where I want to bring this curiosity, more curiosity than assumption, more Sherlock Holmes than Gordon Gecko. I'm not sure if I've just aged myself there. <laughs> a little. <laughs> like Gordon Gecko, Wall Street kind of tycoon from the, from the film. Uh, it's all about him. Whereas seek first to understand before being understood. And it's also remembering that it's not about you. Right. Ultimately, it can be about you. But first, you need to put yourself in the mindset of the person you're communicating with. And one of the best bits of preparation people can do is what I call the bunch of fives. Okay. Imagine the palm of your hand, bunch of fives. 
and we use this in the in the police and in, and and elsewhere. And you can apply this to any situation, any conversation you have. And it's what are the top five challenges, issues, threats, problems, demands, whatever that are likely to show up or get in the way okay. of this working out the way you want it. Is it the way that the other side see you? They perceive you? Is there, so, is there some actually some kind of genuine criticism that they could levy against you? But let's be honest here. You know, I call it the mirror never lies test. You can BS yourself all day long, but you, or other people rather, but you look in the mirror, you, you know what's true. Right. And so you have to have that, that take that time to build up your bunch of fives of, okay, if, if, I, if I was this person, what would I... What would I throw into the mix here? What would I levy against me? Because you, you may be thinking, oh, well, if I say that, that's going to insert a bit of doubt in their mind or I'm going to jeopardize the deal. But far from it, that doubt is already there. It's like an elephant in the corner. It's like a bad smell lingering that unless you deal with it, you won't be able to resolve it and move on. So you get your headspace right, manage your emotional state, and then you do your bunch of fives. And then you realize that a negotiation, there's three elements to it. There's your own mindset, your own emotional state, we've just said. There's what's going on on their side, on their team. Is you dealing with an individual, with a group of people, the real power plays, the real decision makers. And also you've got your own side as well. There's those three elements. And as I mentioned about the crisis within the crisis earlier, sometimes dealing with your own side the systems and processes, the rules and regulations that you may have, they may be getting in the way of you getting a good deal here. So there's the three elements. And it's approaching the negotiation with, okay, negotiation can be divided and really, I guess, into two further parts there. And that is, it's about gathering information so you can solve problems. And remind me, I'll come back to that in a second. And the second, and I think probably the most important aspect is, developing and building relationships. Yes. And where most people go wrong is they look to emphasize the first element of trying to problem solve and too quickly before they spent the time to work on the relationships, build rapport, you know, empathize, build rapport, bring about trust. And that is a golden trust is the golden thread that runs through all successful negotiations. And it's the reason why there's a 93% chance of the hostages coming back in a hostage negotiation when there's, when there's, a, when there's a, a structured negotiation in place. A 93% success rate. They're pretty high odds when you think it's the most unregulated, ungoverned, dangerous, dangerous. In industry in the world. And... And that's why, because you've spent the time, and the same in business, the same in personal, in your personal life. If you spend the time establishing rapport, building trust, you've then earned the right to start influencing and persuading people and seeking that cooperation and collaboration. But that takes time. And there's a sequence to it. Th there's absolutely, there's a sequence to it. And if you want to ultimately see some kind of change in behavior, in attitude, in emotions. And as I said, you want to be aiming for that cooperation and collaboration rather than coercion. Is you start off with, I always say to people, you want to eat more pies. And they look at me as if, who's this crazy Brit? <laughs> we, we talk about eat more pies. Well, it's a, it's a mnemonic that I, I talk about in the book and I go yeah. through it in detail there. And essentially these are a series of techniques that you can apply, that enable you to truly actively listen, empathize, and establish rapport. And I'm sure a lot of people listening to this will think, yes, I know active listening. I, I can do this. I've, I've heard other podcasts about it or I've read about it. Yeah, you may know it intellectually, but have you really mastered it? at the physical, at the emotional level, just as it become part of your DNA that you can do it instinctively. And some of the really most powerful techniques out of the more pies that work for me, and what I'll emphasize here is, and I'll go through some of them in a second, is pick the ones that work for you. 
this is not a tick box exercise. Right. It's like, right, I'm sitting down for this conversation and uh, right, rapport, tick. <laughs> empathy. Em- empathy tick. demonstrated. <laughs> tick. Trust. Yet still working on that. No, no, this is it's a continuous revolving process. And so the ones that I particularly like are labeling, the emotional labeling, which is the E in, e in the more pies. pies. And this is where it allows me to demonstrate my understanding of what is going on for you. It looks like, it sounds like, it feels like, it seems like. And then I will fill in the blank with the emotion. But, you know, it, it sounds like you're really interested in this conversation of what I've got to say, as opposed to, seems like you're really bored right now. Um, or you could, be, you could apply that to behavior as well. And again, that's just a first step in you seeking to understand. And if you can build on that label by some kind of summarizing or paraphrasing where your interpretation of what the person has just said. And I particularly find that really, really powerful. And I might say something like, um, is it okay if I just share with you where I think you're at with this deal right now? And no one's going to say, no, no, be quiet. I'm talking. And they're going to go, yeah, yeah, sure. And I would articulate, trying to use your words as well, as to your viewpoint, your perspective. I will look to identify what the underlying emotions are by using one of the labeling uh, phrases, for example. And by doing so, it enables you to get to a place where you feel seen, heard, and understood. And if you do, you, I've then got a, an open goal. I've then earned the right to then start looking to try and persuade you and bring about that cooperation. But it takes time. Um, it's having what I call a sensory acuity. Imagine like a radar on the top of your head. You walk into a room or you're on the telephone or on a Zoom call having a conversation with somebody and you're constantly scanning for the mood music. And particularly if you don't rely or think you don't rely on your emotions that much, you know, particularly if you're data-driven, fact-based, process kind of person, my invitation to you is to just take a couple of seconds every so often just to tune into... What is going on right now? Not physically, not logistically, right. not, pre- not, not uh, one thing after another, it's, but emotionally, what is the mood here? Is the congruency between what this person is saying and their body language or their tone of voice? Is this person being really genuine right now? Do I feel they've got my intentions at heart here? Or is it all about them? Are they an ego-driven, kind of manipulative narcissist that... You know, and so even though we will pick up this subconsciously, sometimes we override that or we, we drown that out by our logical part of our brain. Right. And so again, just to reiterate is the invitation is to really take the moment, take a couple of breaths, become really present in the moment and, and just tune into what is showing up for you, importantly, but for other people. And then as a result of that, you can then change course. You can then maybe ask a question. You could summarize going, do you know what? I don't know if it's just me or is, is there a bit of a, is a bit of an awkwardness here or, or have we just gone off, off track a little? Is it, can we just take two minutes to gather our thoughts or is it worth me or shall I just summarize where I think we're at? Cause I think we've slightly gone off, off, off script here. And this is a skill you can use in everyday communication. This is not just reserved for negotiation. You could be on a date. You could be with your coworkers. And you can start to label, paraphrase, summarize what's going on around you and see, okay, am I getting an accurate read here of what I'm picking up as I start to tune in to this listening skill that maybe I haven't been paying attention to because I'm mostly analytical and logical in my day-to-day? And a good example of this is, you know, when people are passive-aggressive, you know, in a relationship, no, I'm fine. Well, clearly you're not fine. Right. Um, 
and that that's an invitation. That is a that is a golden goal opportunity for you to practice and demonstrate some of this, because you know full well that your partner usually is not fine. Um, but you're right. You know, at work, a colleague could be struggling, and they just they've got this heroic archetype. They're going to plow on. They're almost a bit of victim mentality, a bit of a martyr of, no, I'm going to struggle, I'm going to carry Keep the going, burden. Yeah. It's like, brother, let, let's, you know, it seems like you're carrying a lot here. How can I best support you with this? And, you know, you have to meet people where they're at and you you offer them the hand and if they, if they don't want to take it, they don't take it and you go, fine. But you're right, life presents you opportunities every single day to practice this. So... Jumping back, I think the important thread around trust, I think for a lot of us, because we think about deals very cerebrally or we've seen them in movies and we think about, okay, I want to get the best deal for myself. But that's actually not the conclusion of the negotiation. You have to live with that deal. Like you have to get your car serviced at that dealership after you got one over on that person or, oh, great, you got one over on the house, but they can still come after you for something. So a deal does, doesn't end when the negotiation is over. So building trust manages the reputation they're after the deal and might make them more likely to do another deal with mm. you, make them more likely to promote you later. So I think it's really important to zoom out when we start to think about negotiations. It's not just like, what am I getting and how do I get the win-win-win for everybody? But what are the repercussions long term to my reputation, the person the other side's reputation? And that's an important part of the equation that I think we often miss in movies and in pop culture. Yeah, it's spot on. And we often think when the signature is on the dotted line, that's it, Phew, negotiation is over. But even on a more everyday um, example, there, there's a great little independent coffee shop near where I live. And the first couple of times I went in there, um, they didn't quite get the order right. And I'm at the age now where I kind of, you know, I like my coffee a certain Same way, way. I like my tea. And, um, but again, I applied some of these skills because initially I'm like, how can you get this wrong? You know, that, that's, but that's the, that's the, the mind that kicks in. And I'm not saying that's ever going to go away, but if you can recognize it, interrupt it and they go, Hmm, okay, maybe I'm not communicating this in the right way, but cut long, long story short, because I was looking to establish that trust and that cooperation long term, because I knew I wanted to come back to this coffee shop where I could sit in the corner, I could be one of those people who fire their laptop up. Unbothered, uh, do unbothered, your thing. Unbothered, do my thing. This, this could be my place to do it. And I didn't want to jeopardize that <laughs> on the very first outing. But that worked off because as, as the weeks went by and I got to know the staff more and I'd built that trust, they'd, they'd bring my coffee over. But at the side, there'd be a a piece of homemade cake or pie, oh. or there'd be these little treats, or it'd be like, no, no, this one's on us. So you're eating more pie. I I'm eating more pies, literally, <laughs> which thankfully I've got a high metabolism. Um, but, but the point is there, had I been a jerk at the beginning? Yeah. You know, that they, they could have just constantly messed up my order. They could have ignored it. Oh, sorry, we've forgotten. Oh, or gone slower, yeah. Um, put the wrong order in or whatever. So, so you're right, it applies to every aspect, which is why I say you want to have this long-term, lifelong relationship. Because if you're a business, the best form of business is repeat business and referrals. Absolutely. Saves the marketing costs, <laughs> save all that hassle and sales. If these people want to come back, there's a queue of outside the door. People want, they want to, to invite everyone they, they know want to, to come invite back. Everybody to come in here. And so, but because you've spent the time to establish that trust, that credibility, which is underpinned by likability. Never underestimate the power of likability in your conversations. Doesn't mean you've got to be false. Doesn't mean you've got to be inauthentic. It doesn't take much to not be a jerk and just be, just be a nice person. Even when you're dealing with difficult, obnoxious people, doesn't mean you've got to be like it. And I think there's a, I forget one of the Stoics would say, the best thing you could do when you meet people like that is not become that. Like that. I think it's Marcus Aurelius said it, you know, that's the best thing you can do is not become like them. Yeah. And in a lot of these situations, we 
aren't dealing with difficult people. We're just dealing with someone else who also wants to go about their day or wants to work with you or wants to sell their car. And they have other objectives and outcomes outside of the deal that we're striking. So circling back, first off, active listening, mm. moving aside our assumptions. And, and if we have them, maybe bringing them into the conversation to unpack further and make sure that those assumptions are correct instead of just moving forward. Clarify, verify each step of the way because there's a danger really, really easily and quickly assumption leaks into the proceedings. But again, if I'm spending the time to genuinely listen at a deep level, I call it level five listening. You know, this is where you're listening to what is not being said. You look, you're listening for the, what the, are they holding back? The, what, what are they, they holding back? The, the, the tone, the nuance there. You can't do that if you're listening at level one or level two, which I talk about in the book around my Amazon delivery should be here by now or what I'm going to have for lunch or I'm looking, just waiting to rebut your argument. I'm waiting to speak. And so, but if you spend that time and the effort to listen deeply and you're summarizing and you're checking in and you're clarifying and verifying, this is all really great empathy. And people misunderstand what empathy is about. It's not sympathy or pity, and it's not quite compassion. But empathy is a doing word. You do empathy. It's, it's me physically demonstrating or attempting to demonstrate my understanding of what you're thinking, feeling, and doing. Who you are. And then you feel rapport and trust as a result of me doing empathy. And so I do that on that sequence and I build a rapport, I build a trust. I then earn the right, as I said, to start influencing and persuading and then looking to bring that cooperation about. A hang up that a lot of our listeners share and even our clients who work with us is, well, we don't have anything in common. And how could you have anything in common with a criminal? You're a police officer. So how are you building rapport with criminals? Okay. What's the mindset for you behind building rapport? Again, people overcomplicate it. You know what? Yeah, I'm degree educated, but I'm a simple guy, really. You know, okay. uh, and I think it was Tony Robbins who says that complexity is the enemy of execution. Absolutely. And we've got to keep it simple here. Uh, and you're right. I had nothing in common with kidnappers and people who say, oh, look for the common ground. Hey, yeah, do you know what? I supported that football team once. And oh, yeah, uh, you're a no. Fulham fan. OK, great. Yeah, We're yeah. Gonna get oh, along. Yeah. I, I like cheese, too. And it's like, no. And you've only got to look at siblings. Any, anyone who's with kids can testify <laughs> this. They've got the greatest link of commonality in the world, but they don't all fight and moan and squabble. So looking for elements of commonality, it's a bit of a red herring there. And so you're better off going, right, what is driving this person? If I can listen and articulate back, actually, this person's needs are, they need a safe face here. Okay, you're dealing with somebody who may be three or four levels above you in an organization. Is, you know full well, they're, particularly if they may be a baby boomer or even a Gen, Gen X, they're, they're not going to take too kindly if you're a Gen Z uh, telling them what to do. You know that's not going to go down well. Right. You know they want an element. I'm, okay, I appreciate it. I'm generalizing here stay with me, is you know full well they're going to feel or want to feel like they're in control. They're going to save face. They want an input in this. But you can play to that. You can use these techniques we've just gone through, um, clarifying and verifying with them, okay, how would you like this done? What does success look like for you? How can I best support you with this? You know, it, it sounds like this is a really important project that you want oversight of every step of the way and you want me to check in with you three times a week. Is that correct? Actually, Scott, no, it may be yes to start with, but over time it may be, do you know what, Scott, I trust you now because you've established your credibility and therefore rapport and carry on and speak to me once a week instead. So rapport really is just the feeling it can be that warm, fuzzy feeling, I guess, when you feel listened to, you feel seen, heard, and understood, you feel there's some trust there, and see rapport as almost the umbrella with which all of that sits under. 
Yeah, you actually care about the other person. You're... Genuinely. Right. G g genuinely. And, okay, you may argue, well, Scott, how could you care about the kidnappers? Well, I cared about them in the sense of I needed to get the hostages back. And if I, if I was really judgmental or sarcastic or dismissive in our communication with them, even though I may have felt that and thought that, that wasn't going to go down well. So I had to, I had to genuinely, intention matters, I had to genuinely put on that, that mindset of everybody needs to walk away here and it's going to mean difficult conversations, managing expectations, high emotion, but ultimately it's focusing on what is the desired outcome here. And in my case, it was a safe release of the hostages, but for you it could be, you know, getting that deal over the line, building a better relationship with your kids, whatever. Now, you mentioned this earlier around logic and emotion, and I know that there's uh, some common parlance around right brain, left brain, but you bring up in the book great research around the four characters of the brain, and it's not just about one side, left or right, ruling the other. Yeah, again, there's been lots of misconceptions in terms of my understanding, hey, I'm not a neuroscientist, um, I'm not scientifically qualified, but I was practicing this in the real world. I, I kind of learned the science afterwards, you know, after 10, 15 years of doing this, because I had a ringside seat into the human condition. How did people think, feel, and act, particularly when they faced times of stress, overwhelm, crisis, conflict, uncertainty, no matter where it was in the world, which industry or sector, which culture, which nationality was involved, there were certain themes and patterns that, that showed up. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't know the science behind this at the time. I'm just working on what, I'm, what works, what doesn't, learning from, Pattern recognition. learning from more experienced colleagues. And then when I kind of stepped back from doing the active negotiations, I started looking into the neuroscience about it in the research. And this whole concept around left, brain, right brain that you mentioned is actually not true at all. You know, we have two amygdala. We have both sides of the brain can have emotional and logical aspects. And the reason I mentioned in the book is it's around how can you best tune into what's going on for you. So that, that awareness, that self-awareness, part of the emotional intelligence piece of, okay, which element of my brain is showing up here. And again, I, I, I read about it with Jill Bolt Taylor in her book, uh, Whole Brain Living. And she assigns these different characters to the brain. Um, and again, if anybody's done any kind of personality or behavioral type assessment, you know, there's different colors or different right. styles or archetypes even. And there's these different elements of the brain where actually, am I in the peaceful, loving, harmonious, collegiate type part of my brain? Or, or am, I, am I in the warrior type mindset of get out of my way, I'm coming through, I'm going to get this done, for example. And you can give these different elements, some come up with some names for them, whatever works for you. And the, and the point behind what she was making in her book and why, what I reference it in mine is when you hit by the tsunami of overwhelm, or you're facing the crisis, whatever it is, personally or professionally, it's taking the time to go, to stop, to pause. The power of the pause is really, re really uh, uh, unique. Is that it gives you the space which to go, right, what is showing up for me here? What part of me am I, is in control here? Is it in the, is it my ego that's driving this? Is it my task-focused hungry for recognition type thing, type, type approach, or is this, do I need to be a bit more calmer? Do I need to activate a bit more of a rational part of my brain to this? Am I allowing my intuition to, to run away uh, with, with, with itself here? And Daniel Kahneman also in Thinking Fast and Slow, who sadly passed away recently um, around, this is, what we're not saying here is, Dismiss logic. Right. And just make all your decisions emotionally. We're not saying that at all. What we're saying is 
you need to be able to identify and manage those emotions. The forces at work. The forces at work. Knowing what part of you is showing up is driving this, i.e. driven by your intention usually. Which part of you do you need to tap into? Which, which part of your identity do, do, do you need to bring to the fore here? And what's the logic? What's the rationality here? What's the objective viewpoint that could kind of blend and, and merge with this emotion? That's the kind of sweet spot you want to get at. Well, you mentioned emotional intelligence, and I think a, a lot of times when that gets thrown about, we look at, okay, well, how can I use that against someone else or how can I recognize their emotions? But a big part of it is the self-awareness piece of actually managing your own emotions, labeling them, understanding what those emotions are before trying to project onto others and read what their emotions are. Mm. So for you in these situations, I mean, you're, as you said earlier, you're not getting called at like Wednesday afternoon after you had tea at your favorite coffee shop. You're getting called two in the morning. Maybe you didn't sleep well and now you're sprung up and, and you're into action. So were there any strategies that you would use in particular to raise your own self-awareness before moving into these high stakes environments? Yeah. Over the years, I developed what I call an immediate action drill, an IA drill, a three-step process. And you can apply this for you're about to walk on stage or give a business presentation. You're about to pick up and have that phone call. You know, the one, the conversation yeah, we, we mentioned you that earlier, we were talking about, yeah. about at the beginning. Or you can do in the middle of a scenario, a situation where you suddenly get hit by this, this stress ball or curve ball from the offside there. You get right. I don't want to drown in this, in this overwhelm here. What am I going to do? And there's three steps. The first step is you've got to interrupt the pattern. And so, for example, you may be on social media and a post will pop up and it will trigger the life out of you. And you don't have to go very far to, no, to get that these not days. These days. <laughs> or is that just me? I don't know. <laughs> and so, I mean, that is probably one of the most common ways that people do get triggered now. And so the first step is to interrupt the pattern, which would be in that case, just turn the turn the social media off, put the phone down, take some breaths, go outside, stand up if you're sitting down, or if you're in the boardroom, you could just do some breathing, for example. And what that does is it stops you, prevents you from spiraling into that negative, downward, Reactive, disempowering, yeah. knee-jerk reaction that's not going to serve anybody, least of all you. So interrupt the pattern. The second stage, and for anyone who's surfed, skied, skateboarded, will we'll hopefully get this analogy of you've got to ride the wave. You've got to kind of carve it out, but ride the wave is the way I describe it. And... After you get that trigger, that stimulus, whatever it is, you've got about 90 seconds, two minutes, where that fight or flight has kicked in. You've got the cortisol, adrenaline, and other stuff just coursing through your body. And they're usually the moments when we do or say something which we later regret. Again, hopefully I'm not the only person who's ever done that. And so... So you got to interrupt the pattern. You've got to ride the wave. you just got to feel the feeling and drop the story. And so usually when you get that, that trigger or those nerves are looking to get the better of you and before every call with the kidnappers, I would just tune into, okay, what is showing up in my body right now? Okay, there's a, there's a swirling in my stomach or a, a tightness or a tension in my shoulders or even as like a slight headache perhaps. Okay, well, let me just spend 90 seconds, two minutes, tuning into that and not worry about the story as to why I'm feeling it. So feel the feeling, but drop the story. Because otherwise, I'll get into that spiral of naming, blaming, and shaming the person or the reason why I'm now feeling like that. And that's not going to help you because the third step is you need to ask better questions. And you can't ask better questions if you're really het up, you're angry, you're tense, you're looking to just point the finger and shout at people. And if you ask better questions, you get better answers. And these would be open questions such as, okay, well, 
what am I not seeing here? You know, I mentioned some of these earlier. What's the opportunity here? How else could I look at this? What does this person need for me right now? What do I need right now? How can I best resolve this situation? All these questions that you wouldn't be able to answer as well as you might, might do if you're stuck in that disempowering story. And so I always keep that metaphorical drill in my back pocket. So of interrupting the pattern, riding the wave and asking better questions for sitting down for this podcast, for going on stage and giving a keynote, walking in and seeing my kids after, you know, a busy day. Just stop, interrupt the pattern, put park work mode, just tune in, just take a couple of deep breaths. Right. How can I set, how can I show up for my kids right now? And then away you go. So for a lot of our listeners, that negotiation with your kids is happening quite frequently. And I know you break down some signals that our kids are sending in, in the book and what they actually mean versus what our natural reaction to them are. I'd love for you to unpack those for our parents in the audience. Yeah. And, and again, I, I learned this the hard way. <laughs> I mean, my kids are old, you know, older teenagers now. So they, they know every trick in the book, by the way. When they were in kindergarten age, they'd be... Well, they've they, trained with a master, they, master they, negotiator. They, so. they thought it was cool that... Daddy's away hunting pirates, and now they'll just roll their eyes. You know, they, they know every <laughs> trick, and, and they still know which buttons to press. Um, but, yeah, yeah so w when a kid has been, and again, I learned this, I, I, I learned the, the science behind it afterwards, having done it kind of for experienced real, it. experienced it for many, many years. Um, around... A lot of them, they, they're just looking for some control around the decision making. So when my kids were younger, it would be, you want them to wear a jumper and they don't want to wear a jumper. So I would say literally, do you want to wear the, the red or the blue jumper? Knowing full well that their fight was about, they wanted a sense of feeling in control, not they didn't want to wear the jumper. <laughs> and so I didn't care which kind of jumper they wore. Right. As long as it was a jumper. <laughs> and also learned this from... Um, a great book that, that's recently come out, Good Inside, about parenting. Um, and in it, the, the, the writer, the author talks about how, and this applies to adults, but particularly with kids, is the, 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 your child as they are, as, as a human being, you could say in your left hand, you look at your, your left hand, okay, that's my child and all their magnificence. The fact they even exist at all is wonderful human being. And in your other hand, these are all the dramas, the issues, the tantrums, the paddies, the back chat, the belligerence, the defile, the, the whole gamut that comes with having kids. And what we, we tend to do is we merge them together. Mm just like we would do with colleagues, people in public life, whomever it happens to be, where actually we want to be able to separate the person from their behavior and understand what is driving that so-called bad behavior. Right. It's all it is, it's an unmet need. It's an unmet need. And if you can look to identify what those unmet needs are, then you resolve the, the tantrum or the problem. The negative behaviors. And a, a, an example would be, a classic example is, we, you see this in the store a lot, or maybe it was just with my kids, I don't know, <laughs> is that they'll, they'll see some candy on the shelf and they'll, and they'll want it there and then. And you go, no, darling, you can't because you're going to have dinner when we get home. I'm trying to log be logical, rationalize, objective with them. Of course you can't have it. You're going to have your dinner in half an hour. Why on earth would you want a chocolate bar <laughs> half an hour before your dinner? But then what do they do? They have a paddy, a tantrum, kicking and screaming on the store yeah. floor. And so what, again, what I learned and subsequently discovered through the science is actually until you can balance out, bring down that emotive, anxious stressful state through some of the tools and techniques that we've just gone through. You're never going to bring about that objective, rational thinking and decision-making. Um, 
And so that was a that was a great help. And then the other technique uh, I use my kids, and this seems to be pretty prevalent as teenagers, is for the example of, you know, they'll leave wet towels on the bathroom floor. <laughs> and there's the, there's the saying I use, when you, so you identify the behavior, when you, I feel because, and then what I want to see. So in the wet towel uh, example, it would be, when you leave wet towels on the floor, I feel a little frustrated because we've all got to share this bathroom and it would just be helpful if you could put the towels back on the towel rail once you've finished so we can all use the bathroom uh, in, a, in a nicer way as opposed to how many times Somebody do I have to tell you? you don't leave them on the floor and then it ends a bit of you never listen to me and oh, goes down that spiral so that when you I feel because, and then the behavior you want to see, it can just take out the a bit of the poison or the negativity. And hey, I'm not saying this is easy. Everything we've gone through and everything in the book, it's simple and highly effective and practical, but it's not necessarily easy unless you practice. Consistency is key. This is not a one-time trick pony where you do the technique once and then you're some kind of Jedi knight. You know, this is a consistency right. is key. Well, that's that's the piece that we're talking about is the emotion. So, yeah, I'd, I'd love to control my child's emotions, but I have my own emotions here. And if I'm not practicing these and I'm not applying it as much as I can in heightened emotional states, in low emotional states, I'm not going to be able to rally the troops in the most important critical moments of that negotiation. Yeah, absolutely. And you make a really good point there around it then becomes a battle of wills, going back to your kids again. Hang on, I'm right, I'm the parent, and of course you've got to have boundaries and you've got to be able to prevent harm or damage coming to stuff. That, that That's a given. But, but most of the time, we're not talking about those situations. Right. We're talking about this battle of wills or your own emotions clouding your decision-making. And if you can't... De develop again that emotional intelligence and that sensory acuity of how am I thinking, how am I feeling, and how am I acting, and doing so in the best possible way. You are metaphorically leaving money on the table from a negotiation perspective. You are not building as much trust as you can do, and ultimately, you're not achieving that cooperation and collaboration, which is what you want in the first place. Yeah, a great way to end it here. I'd love to. No, what are the main takeaways you'd love the audience to know about the book itself and, and your career? Yeah, I, I said the book is, it's four years in the writing, but 15 years in the making. And I wanted to really capture, I want it to be a, a practical tools and techniques underpinned by real life case studies where it's worked. And no matter the situation, no matter the circumstances that you find yourself in, there's a process, there's a sequence to go through from your mindset and emotions at one end to bringing about cooperation and collaboration and a client for life at the other. All the things that can go in the way, can get in the way, how you identify and overcome them. And I end the book with the, again, another invitation to people to seek out worthy opponents. And those worthy opponents could be people, situations, conversations that you avoid, you don't want to have, it's outside your comfort zone. It's maybe a conversation you're not having with yourself. And every day gives you so many opportunities to meet or seek out these worthy opportunities, the worthy opponents, sorry, because if you do, it's like going to the gym. That's how you build muscle. It could be, okay, a worthy opponent could be you are suddenly stuck in traffic on the freeway and you're late for a meeting. You're like, rather than punching the dashboard and cursing, I'm oh, okay, you could do that for 20, okay, have 30 seconds, have, right, have 90 seconds, have a 90 Come second, on. two minutes, do that. <laughs> it's but then right, what? It's like, right, I'm riding the wave. I can't do anything about it. This traffic jam is a worthy opponent. I can utilize this, I can practice this, I can develop my resilience 
to cope with uncertainty and things outside of my control. And 99.9% .9 of everything that happens to us is outside of our control. And that seeking out worthy opponents, it develops that resilience, as I said. And most people think resilience is a hashtag on a mug or a T-shirt. But it's not. It's hard for and hard one. Right. It's something you do and you harness and you practice, whether or not it's a traffic jam, whether or not it's trying to deal with your disruptive kids, an ego-driven boss, a business deal that has fallen through and people are blaming you. Maybe you're, you've got a disempowering story about exercising or losing weight or leaving a relationship or whatever it is. It's you've got to develop that muscle of being comfortable with being uncomfortable and yet seek out the worthy, worthy opponents and watch how those conversations and your communication and your negotiation soar. Well, thank you for fighting the worthy opponent of LA traffic for joining <laughs> me today. It's a pleasure. Where can our audience find the book? Yeah, the book is available wherever books are sold. Um, and they can also go to my website, scottwalkerbooks.co.uk and find out more information there. I'm on LinkedIn and Instagram and the usual places. Beautiful. Thank you for stopping by. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm.